Good evening and welcome to the BS and Beer Show. BS stands for Building Science. If you don't know that already, I, you live under a rock. No, I'm kidding. So uh, tonight's topic and guest is Building Science Fight Club with Christine Williamson, and it's going to be an Ask Me Anything. And since we're greedy hosts, we're going to ask our questions first, and maybe we'll let a couple of chat questions. I, I'm going to answer two. Well, I'm going to answer at least one right now. No, this is not a bathrobe. <laughs> <laughs> Oversized. Anyway, okay, keep going, Emily. It's Go just ahead. A comfortable sweatshirt. I'm, I'm kind of in my loungewear too, right? You know, we shouldn't have to dress up either for these Ain't shows. So. <laughs> I'm Emily Matram. I'm an architect here in Maine, and uh, Travis will be proud. I found me some gluten free beer to have on BS and Beer tonight. Um, we are an independence grassroots movement. Everybody who shows up on this show, hosts and guests, uh, donate their time to make this happen every week. So give a big shout out and thank you to our guests for showing up and sharing their expertise, their knowledge and their time with us. Uh, we do want to thank Green Building Advisor and Fine Home Building as our media partner who makes this happen every week on Zoom Live and then also does the follow-up shows on YouTube after the show is over. So if you've missed any shows and you want to catch up, they're all up on YouTube and you can check out the blog on Green Building Advisor under the BS and Beer Show. So Travis, you're on announcements tonight. Oh, I'm ready. I got all kind of announcements. I'll start by announcing that I'm drinking a B and Stefaner, half of ice beer which is one of my favorites. And I will not admit to how many this is for me today. We just finished up a webinar before this one. I will tell you it's not my first. So uh, the announcements pertinent to this show though, uh, you'll wanna find the chat box icon at the bottom of your screen and post your questions and comments there. Gotta be sure to click all panelists and attendees or everyone, because if you don't do that, Zoom likes to revert back to panelists only, which means only we can see your comments and I'm not smart enough to follow the chat and the screen. Uh, and the chat, uh, the actual show. So I, I'm not going to be able to do that. So please click all, everyone, everyone. Fine Home Building sends out Zoom reminders each week. If you want to receive those as well as our other information, join our mailing list at thebsandbeershow.com or check out the weekly post to Green Building Advisor that goes up on Sunday mornings. If you have not been receiving the emails, please check your spam box. The video recording of tonight's show will be available at Green Building Advisor, and all past shows can be found on YouTube and through a link at thebsandbeershow.com. An audio-only version of the BS and Beer Show is available on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. And then there's going to be some links that Mike is a wizard at adding. Thank you, Mike. You're a magician. And now I'm going to introduce Ben. Ben Bogey, what's up? Hey all. Okay, so this evening I am uh, drinking beer from my second favorite Connecticut brewery. It's OEC Brewing. I think they brew the best stouts outside of or the best sours outside of Europe. This is a, a dry hop sour ale, and uh, I have backups over here because they go down very easily. Um, I have the pleasure tonight of introducing our friend and my friend Christine Williamson. Uh, Christine, as the founder of Building Science Fight Club. Uh, provides technical design consulting services to architects, developers, and contractors, assisting with design development and reviewing details and specifications. She's also a rock star and hero to many in the field, particularly among women. Kylie said that. <laughs> That's in the notes. Christine, how are you this evening? Thanks for being with us. I'm great. I'm great. I'm, I have beverage envy though. I want to, I, I, I can't wait for us to be able to do this all in person sometime at the next conference or something. And, uh, and then we can really experiment with the beverages by, you know, if someone gets one round, someone else gets the next. So well, I'm coming over for my manicure. I want you to serve me a drink when I come by. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> We're all going to fill our carry-ons with beer. I'm sure the yep. airlines will be uh, love that. Something that we didn't mention, but got put in the chat boxes, is that uh, the BS and Beer Show will be live at NAHB IBS this year. Um, Christine Ooh, will also be joining us on that stage, and we might just twist her arm into joining us on live BS and Beer. If oh lucky, yeah, so. I'm in. That's nice. well, you had to twist that arm real hard. Yeah, I figured that was <laughs> a hard one. <laughs> so. Uh, I guess I'll just kick it right off. It's open format tonight, so we can ask you anything. Uh, I have some horticulture questions about some Japanese maples that I'm dealing with, which I hope you're okay taking those. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> no, in, in, in all seriousness, um, we have some prepared behind the scenes here, so I'll just rattle into one of them and we'll get the conversation going. Oh, okay. Uh, in, in, 
in terms of information sharing, something you super excel at, uh, what do you think are the most pressing methods, materials, issues to get out there for industry pros to understand now? Uh, okay, so two things. Um, one is a technical thing and the other is, a, is an attitude thing. Um, I think attitude wise, this is something that the people here, the, the panelists and every name that I recognize in the chat already does. Um, but to have a kind of, to approach this profession seriously, but with a level of humility, uh, I think is really important. Not, um, it, building is complicated. There's a lot of trade-offs that we, that we make and it's not just understanding the science itself that matters. It's making judgments about the science and um, understanding that different people value different things and might make different judgments based on the same set of information um, can be uh, kind of difficult. Um, so I think that's sort of a, I guess, a, an attitude that is helpful to learning um, rather than say a um, gatekeeper type approach. Like you learn something and it's a way for you to, or, or learning is a way for you to not be humiliated by other people or, and then knowing something to, in order to kind of win. Um, I think even though that might actually be true in that some of what we do is persuade and um, deal with people who have different opinions on job sites. Um, I think if you go into it with an attitude of, um, of kind of, I guess, intellectual humility and, um, and honesty, intellectual honesty. Um, I think you end up learning a lot better and communicating a lot better. So that's the, the one thing about sort of setting the stage. And then in terms of our industry and teaching, I think really the number one thing has to do, it's so simple, but it has to do with, um, water management in that we're in the business of managing water, not blocking water. Um, now there's lots and lots and lots of stuff that we do there there's, and it obviously gets way more technical from there, but I think fundamentally there are a lot of even professionals that are under the impression that, um, yeah, that we, that we block water and that there are elements in our enclosure that don't, they're not thinking of the enclosure as a system. They're thinking of certain elements as being backup for other stuff when it fails. So sort of like um, when, I, when I teach on this, I talk about the three different water management strategies of, of building types or tip really walls. So you've got perfect barrier walls, mass walls and drained walls. And they look at like the WRB, the water control layer, the code speak WRB, but water control layer. And they look at that as like backup for when the cladding fails by letting water in, it's, it's not failing. It's, it's we're, we're designing the whole assembly to work in a way that manages water appropriately. Um, and it's okay that it's different than mass walls and perfect barrier walls. And actually in each of those three systems are fine. They just have to be appropriate to like, not there isn't one that's better. That's also, I, I'm sure every professional gets asked this by lay people like, well, what's the best way? Well, like it depends on what you're trying to do <laughs> and what resources you have, that kind of stuff. But um, anyway, each of those wall types is appropriate to certain, certain situations in certain settings. And um, that's, a, that's a very, very different manner of thinking of buildings and water management than most of our clients think of things and, and often a lot of our peers as well. Um, which is tricky. <laughs> and when I say peers, I mean, bro very broadly, right? That could be building officials too. It could be, um, it, it could be subcontractors. It could be mechanical contractors. There's anyway, a lot of people, anytime I think like, oh yeah, why, like, why do I have a job? Everybody's got this. We're good. We're good. And then something happens and I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. This is why I have a job. <laughs> um, anyway, those are the, the two main things. I think I saw a lot of nodding there. Those are good ones. It's, it, it's incredible what you can learn when you shut up and listen for a little bit. Oh my gosh. I wish I could like go back in time and tell myself that in my twenties, <laughs> shut up, <laughs> you need to listen more. <laughs> I think I needed to hear earlier than that. Yeah, probably so. <laughs> I think we talked about that even last week on the, on the um, conspiracy theories, right? There was open joint cladding. 
came up, right? And we talked about the fact of what the cladding does and what the WRB does and what what's supposed to happen in the system. And and you're right, every time you think like, oh, someone's figured it out. And then you write a pretty good house book because clearly nobody's figured it out yet. Or you're Christine. And you know, one of my questions um was what made you create building science for architects, right? This is your course. This is what you got going on. Like Clearly you thought that we needed to know this as architects. I'll be the token architect and my designer. So building science for architects and designers, um, like there was clearly a need for this and you decided it was important to create it. So what was your, what was your reasoning behind creating that? So there's two things to it. So one, and I will admit here, uh, to picking a title for marketing reasons, um, the course is fine for anybody who wants to take the course. Like a committed owner could take it. A high school student who is really interested in, in learning could take it. It's not, um, there's nothing like, there's not a, a magical realm of information that architects possess that, that I'm getting to in the course that only, that only they, they make it so that only they can take it. Um, partially it was, um, I guess I just really think that, so this information I think is valuable for everybody in our, or maybe not everybody, but most people in our industry. But I think in particular, there are already a lot of resources geared towards builders and the architect, the resources that are geared towards architects, I, I have not found to be particularly helpful. Um, the majority of our learning continuing education anyway. So school, as you know, is not typically geared to, doesn't provide a very good technical foundation. The technical foundation comes from when you start practicing in your individual firm. And, and then a lot of it is sponsored by materials manufacturers. And there's a lot of really great materials manufacturers um, who support great building science and, and provide pretty good resources. But I would say that that's on the less, uh, um, I want to see you navigate this. Keep going. I'm drinking a cocktail. Um, it, I, I think it's more rare than I would like it to be. Um, and that I think most of us would like it to be and, and manufacturers have different interests than architects. And when you've got a manufacturer that's in front of you for a lunch and learn, um, and, and architects might have a different interest too. Like some of it is just, I, I need my CE hours. I'm really stinking busy. Um, so I'm going to sit here at not listen to this presentation, but I'm going to sign my name on it and I'm going to have lunch <laughs> and like, there we go. And it's an exercise in ticking a box. Um, but anyway, so I, I think there's all kinds of weaknesses in the way that in continuing education for, for architects. And so I, and then, and then in, in addition to not having as many resources that I thought were very good, um, I think that some of the ways that this is taught to architects is demeaning to them. Um, and I don't like that. I don't like learning like that. I, sometimes it's actually pretty aggressive too, if the teaching is being done by sales people. Um, and I don't know if this is really a fair observation, but, uh, but maybe it is. I think builders, maybe because they interact they have a different kind of relationship with people selling them things. Like they're the direct buyer, right? So I think a lot of times they're just a little bit more used to that, those aggressive tactics and architects. Like I just, I can't understand how people think that that works with them. And maybe I'm the big fool and that it does anyway, but I, it doesn't work to, for me. I don't like heavy handed stuff. I don't like a manufacturer to tell me my stuff is the best in every circumstance is hundred percent of the time. Um, there are no weaknesses. What weakness? There's only pros, no cons, features and benefits. We're just going to talk about those. Like that's annoying to me. Um, I prefer a more nuanced discussion anyway. And so I didn't see it out there. So I thought, well, let me see if I can do it. Maybe architects will want it from, well, maybe they'll want to hear it from me. But lots of other people can do it too. Um, I really just picked the, the the title. Oh, and then there's one more thing. Uh, man, I am pretty chatty here. These cocktails are good. <laughs> um, but I do think that the decision making pro making process is different for designers than builders in that uh, architects have a lot less control over 
the project once construction has started and a lot more control during design. And for builders, bu builders have a great deal of control or they can um, have a lot of control after construction has started. So if you have a design solution, say to drainage or rain screens or whatever it may be, that is more dependent on workmanship and less, and, and maybe, uh, but it costs less, and it costs less. Um, so it's a little trickier to install, but it costs um, quite a bit less. That's going to be more appealing to a builder than it will to an architect or a designer who doesn't, who doesn't know who the contractor is when they get hired sometimes. So I, I'm, I'm going to favor an approach that is more dependent on design and less dependent on installation, even if it costs a little more, because that's less risky for me and more reliable. Um, and those are anyway, so this, there's just some nuances. So having a course that's geared towards architects can account for those um, differences in the way that the profession is organized and, and um, help people make better decisions when you're talking about the actual decisions that they're usually making, not, you know, not just these sort of hypothetical stuff. Uh, that's by the incidentally, that's one of the big disagreements I have with my dad. Um, I mean, not disagreements. Whenever we disagree on something, I'm like, darn it, it means I'm wrong. Um, but we'll have a, a sort of a, a different bias in that he's a lot more into, well, that's not hard at all. I can totally do that. You should like, everybody should be able to do that. I'm like, well, you can do that, but the builders that I'm seeing can't do that. So I'm not going to recommend, I'm not going to recommend that when I don't know who I'm dealing with. Um, so anyway, so that's a, I, I notice that a lot in my, as I get older and more experienced in this practice, I can see me favoring sort of more conservative design oriented approaches and my dad favoring more jack of all trades, clever field solutions to things. Um, and his, you know, he was a contractor. He started out as a contractor though. So that's his, um, that's his, uh, that's his, that's his jam. Well, your point speaks to the importance of sort of the integrated design process where everyone's involved because at, right. certainly as the builder, one of the things that terrify me is a detail on a print that I know is going to cost three to five times what we can execute with a, a, a cheaper material or an assembly. Right. And I know that the other guy that's bidding, it's going to go, yeah, I'm going to say I can do it for this number. And then I'm going to exclude that language from the proposal, even though it's right. on a print, the, the client doesn't care. They just want the house to not leak. And I can execute that this way. And I'm like, ah, but I got to go. It's on the print. I got to bid the print. So I like the idea of having the knowledge that the architect understands that there are levels and that a skilled installer can make 30 pound felt a very successful WRB. Uh, yeah. yeah. And one of the things I actually, I, I don't know how many people do this on the consulting side, but I offer um, bidding assistance to all of my clients because they don't know if they're like, you think you're getting the same thing, but oftentimes you're not. And people who are starting in the industry sometimes are actually just unethical people want to do this. I've worked with one developer, oh God, I, they were the worst client um, who kind of viewed bidding as sort of a trick. Like if I can get my subs to underbid this, then I win, you know? Um, because, we'll hit them with change orders. It's okay. And, but that shows up on someone else's budget, not mine. You know, I bonus out, these are commercial. I bonus out on this, you know, this way. So I don't care, whatever. And, but most people know that it to get for a job to be more successful and cost less overall, uh, you want accurate bids. You don't want your subs to be losing money on stuff. Um, I mean, if they lose a little bit of money, maybe yeah, you do come out ahead. If they lose a lot of money, you're going to lose on that too. <laughs> There's no way that the owner, that you're not left holding the bag on that <laughs> when, when a sub is losing a lot of money. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I think that goes back to what Travis said with the integrated design approach, what you're teaching architects, right? Is to, even if you're planning something that's going to cost more, if you understand what you're asking the builder to do, and you can have that conversation with the builder, you can arrive at the solution that might cost less, but still meets all of those expectations right, and then right. 
And then one step further back from, from that, or maybe integrated, I think all these things kind of go together is the other thing that I think they don't teach architects and lunch and learns or whatever is hands-on stuff, right? Like if yeah. the SEGA guy wants to sell you something, he might come out to the job site, give you a roll of tape, show you how to use it, use it with you on the job site. You learn those things. We don't get to build walls or put in a window or whatever. Right. So we miss the job site training. So we're always going to stick with something that is less risky, but maybe right. more complicated. Cause I don't know that it's more complicated because maybe I didn't get to build this. And so it goes back to that integrated design approach. The architect needs to spend more time on the job site, learn those hands-on skills. And, you know, the builder needs to have the conversation with the architects. You don't get in that bid war, whatever, which is, you know, not, yeah. none of the builders that are on here, but, um, you know, that is that thing. It was like, I'm going to bid this, but I'm going to build it that way. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, and it's also, there's also a, a big category though, of sort of sweet spot stuff that actually doesn't cost that much less or that doesn't cost that much more money, but actually is less risky. Um, I always, I always, um, try to understand or encourage other people to think of products this way. Like think of the Delta between typical design or typical installation and perfect installation. And some products like inherently that Delta is much bigger. Um, and some it's, it's smaller. I think with mechanically attached house wraps, for example, uh, window detailing, like the difference between perfect installation and typical installation is really big. I think inherently that is smaller with, um, self-adhered membranes and smaller still with fluid membranes, um, in terms of how the detailing happens. Now that's, like, I think you can say that about all kinds of products, but like, what's the difference between typical and perfect installation? Um, silicone sealants are fantastic sealants. They're just, they're, they're awesome, but they require incredibly attentive surface preparation, substrate prep. And um, if you're not gonna have, even though it might be a more durable installation, if you're not going to be able to, if you're not going to be able to get that installation anyway, maybe you're better off picking something else. Um, so you want to align these things. Like what's the skill, what am I likely to, to get out of my labor? I, I did a post once on Instagram about, I forget what I was doing something or other. And, um, some, somebody was really into ICF, which I really like, but somebody who was really into ICF was like, you should do all this with ICF. It's better. It does all these things. I'm like, well, yeah, like everything you've said about ICF, that's true. Except, um, this house, it was about a specific house is in Dallas and there isn't a trade base for ICF here. Um, so sure you could make that work if you were really committed to making ICF work, but you now have to find all, all these other trades to make this system work. Like how am I going to make, I have to get my electrician like to figure this out, this stuff out. I have to like, there's, and now I'm not going to get as many bids for this. So am I okay having only one bid for, for it by making this decision on, you know, whatever it might be. And maybe you are like, maybe the decision is, yeah, we're, we want to do this. Maybe you are, but um, anyway, I guess we got sidetracked on that, but the more architects anyway, the more everybody understands in design, the more they understand about the process of building too, not just the science, but the process of building, the better, they can be better partners uh, with the rest of the, the project team. So. Somebody's talking to I, Joshua. Is I that Joshua from story. Dallas? I, I don't know. Um, Lou Harriman's here. Oh my gosh. There's all sorts <laughs> of great people. My goodness. I totally Wait. ignored the chat box from, from the get go. I'm like, it's blowing up. I have no idea. Michael put it in the, in the document. So many awesome people. Wow. Yeah. I got so, distracted for a second and dove in there and it immediately sucked me in and I had to reply. Sorry about that. Wilson I got Bale. totally oh derailed. Gosh, we got these all-stars here. We got to do this in person. I can't wait for IBS. <laughs> I know. It's going to be great. Everybody come to IBS or watch us live. If you can't come be. to IBS, Christine will do your nails just on your left hand. Uh, <laughs> left hands hands only. Only. <laughs> we'll swap cocktails. It's going to be great. <laughs> oh man. Uh, Christine, a a question I have, and this is actually, 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 um, like a serious question. I want to know uh, or know about. I, I've been trying to refine my window installation details. 
um, and I know I've heard you talk about this, but it hasn't registered yet. Um, like, of course, the industry standard is spray foam. Um, and and I, I'm, I'm taping the exteriors and, 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 and I only on the bottom, I only spray foam the like the inner edge. But what's what's the deal? We, is, is spray foam passe now? Should we be doing tape on both sides? Are, are the squishy foam blocks the way to go? What do, what do you think? So I have a few thoughts on that. Good questions. Uh, one, I'll start like in reverse order. The, the awesome, crazy German tapes and stuff. Uh, have not used any personally on a project, but um, do you guys know Peter Marciano? Uh -uh. Oh my gosh, you should know him. He's a great guy. He um, does um, fantastic work, uh, particularly on masonry, like interior masonry retrofits in New York City. He's done mm -hmm. like single family homes also, but mostly mostly these are big buildings and he's just fantastic. Anyway, um, he was like really skeptical about these tapes, the expanding tape for people who don't know, it's like, it's like a tape, but it expands to fill the gap. So you sort of, it comes compressed and you put it on the, you, the interior or the exterior of your, of your window and it will fill, it'll expand to fill the gap on its own. It takes a little bit of time. Um, and he was, I really trust, um, Peter's opinion on this. And he said he was super skeptical and then tried it on his own, on, on one of his own projects and was like completely blown away. thought it was fantastic. We'll use it anytime he gets a chance. So I haven't used it, but somebody I trust thinks that they're completely awesome. Um, I using spray foam is my least favorite approach to, to, to the interior seal. I think some of that is just my bias from a having the majority of my practice, although not all of it in warmer climates and B starting my, really, I started in commercial construction. And, um, so it just wasn't as common to use interior spray foam for the interior seal at windows. Um, I think people's instinct is like, if I can get a sealant joint with some thermal value, that's why not? Um, I always prioritize water management over thermal performance though. And I think that I can, it, I'm just able to evaluate the continuity of a baccarat and sealant joint a lot better than, um, than spray foam. Um, I don't, I think when people, like when the types of people that are a lot of people who are listening and the people on the panel, including you, like have a lot of experience actually testing your own houses and your own builds. So, um, a lot of people who actually test their own projects find that they still like the, you know, they don't notice a difference in the blower door test results when they use spray foam. So like, I don't see a reason to, to change. If you're getting good test results, you're not having comfort complaints. You're reasonably confident that it's continuous. Like I, there's, there's no objection really. I have none. It's more, uh, well, actually this is another, this is an example. Um, of what I was saying before on the design side, I like, I favor something that I can review in the field because I'm not installing any of this myself. So I can review the continuity of a baccarat and sealant joint in the field. It's very hard for me to tell. I'll be, I can tell the spray foam is there, but I can't really tell how continuous it is. Um, I can't tell if they overfilled the cavity, right? Cause we want to preserve drainage between the two. I can't tell, I can't tell if they've done that. Um, so that's why I favor the baccarat and sealant approach. Um, I think also like we are talking about a window here. So, um, it, if you've got a really high performing window, I can also see the instinct to pursue like every last BTU, um, every la like anywhere you can put insulation, you want insulation. I, I get that instinct, but I also think at a certain point, like, um, my buddy Foster says like the first time you accidentally leave the garage door open at night. <laughs> Like you obliterate savings from like the spray foam around <laughs> I, your, your I generally off, I generally offer the spare change that's in my pocket as the right, right. savings. Exactly. Exactly. But we haven't so, figured in the cost of the foam yet. Well, um, and is there anywhere you talked about blower door testing, which you know the reality is we blower door test right after construction is done. But what's happening a year or two later, 
right? That's with my spray concern foam. with can. That's foam. my concern too. Is like you can't really inspect it, like Christine said, but you don't also really know what's happening a year or two later when everything is really dry. It's settled. It's lived more. in its space. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think. Are you going to, if you've done a reason, if we're comparing like attentive installation with spray foam to attentive installation with tape, attentive installation with backer rod and sealant, I think we probably notice very little difference, um, even long-term, uh, because we don't offer, maybe if you did a blower door test in a few years, that would be different under pressure, but not under pressure. I don't know how much of a difference we really see in service, attentive installation, each one. If we compare again, typical ceiling method for each one, um, I think maybe spray foam performs quite a bit worse. Um, but that's sort of a, that's just a educated guess based on what I see in the field. Not, um, not then again, if you're, if you're, if you're, if you're typical with spray foam or you force someone who typically does spray foam to use tape and exactly. they don't prep the surface very well, tape might actually be, exactly. uh, where, you know, like exactly. It, exactly. Yeah. So right. actually that's a really good point. So I don't really, I don't get up too uptight about this. I start recommending, um, backer rod and sealant because it's my favorite. And if it's my job, I recommend I start with what I like, <laughs> but if, the uh, if, if a builder wants to do, has a, has a strong preference, I, I almost, if I can honor a subcontractor's in preference, a, a, like personal preference on something, I will do everything I can to honor that. Um, you know, cause there's a lot of decision, like, again, thinking holistically about the building, um, you can win, uh, a, discussion about, or a difference of opinion on how to do this interior seal. Um, but there's going to like 99 times out of a hundred, there's going to be a more serious issue on that job that you're going to want to use your capital on rather than this one. <laughs> you know, If everything's a priority, nothing's a priority. So you got to pick the stuff that really counts. <laughs> right. I did a comparative analysis, you know, some wing nut testing on a recent build uh, of the the three different methods, and I, I think you're right on, Christine. I think any one of them can work, and probably the one that I had done the most is one that I like the best because, gosh, I did a really good job at that because that's the way I've been doing the last ten years. So it's like, oh, yeah. backer on the sealant still wins out, and it's like, yeah, you got ten hours with tapes. Maybe if I had five hundred hours with tapes, my tape game would be, wah, but. Yeah, I really think that it's nice to hear from the design side that there's uh, a universal acceptance of a well-performed, well-executed detail, regardless of the material. That's also a great point about integrated design is if you have the builder on board during the design phase, right? So you're not doing bid, the builder's on board, the architect and the builder are talking, we can put our drawings together and the things you know. That means the five things that are really critically important to me that are different from your standard are five things that are acceptable as opposed right. to here's my set of plans. Nothing is the way that you would build it. Everything is a problem. Like it is yeah. that who, you know, win the war on the things that are, are die hard. Like she's asking me to do what here. So. Yeah. Yeah. You, you gotta, you get gain, gain the trust where you can. <laughs> Uh, sp speaking of Lou, Lou Harriman, uh, he asked if your experience chairing the ASHRAE Technical Committee on Moisture Management in Buildings has changed or otherwise affected your own practice or your advice for your clients. Oh, my gosh. In like so many ways, um, mostly completely subtle ways that I don't even I think. Honestly, I think it'll be years before I really sort of understand how helpful ASHRAE has been. So for I mean, I think most people have heard the term ASHRAE in this, in this group, um, American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers, whatever, designers, something or other. I probably said that completely wrong. Um, cocktail, again. But um, what's cool about it is a lot like the building code process, it's a voluntary association. And this is one thing where I was really grateful to spend a lot of my early career working for a pretty big company. Um, I was a consultant with, with Jenny Elsner, WJE for a while, and they supported this kind of 
getting involved in on committees and stuff. Um, now, some of it was sort of silly. They were just, I think they really encouraged employees to just have lots of letters after their names, like get every certification you can get. Um, anyway, the sort of thing I picked was ASHRAE to get involved in. Um, and I like the way you get involved is you just start showing up. And um, yeah, so I just started showing up. They have technical committee meetings in advance of, hold on a second, no ma'am. That is not for puppies. <laughs> Do we have a guest host? Very, we have a guest appearance? Um, We've got to add another panelist. Pancake Williamson is being very cute. Here, here. Oh, sorry, Pancake, okay, okay. come here. See, this is just a disturbing trend. Now everyone's going to go get their dog. Oh my gosh, yes. going to be on screen. Pancake Williamson was um, exploring how hardwood the floors really are. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, with Ashray, so you just have to start showing up. So I started showing up and um, I met these fantastic practitioners and um, people with like just a lot of experience in things and nothing made sense to me at first, but you just keep going and you pick stuff up. And you know people and you know people doing interesting work. And then when something comes up that you haven't seen before, your list of people who you can call is, is now expanded or people who know people who, who are doing stuff is just bigger and bigger. And, um, and then we come across these standards. So ASHRAE essentially does or commissions a whole bunch of research, like codifies it or... I don't know, that's probably the wrong word because I'm about to talk about the building code, but that research and those standards end up becoming the basis of a lot, not all of, of the building codes and understanding how that works is really cool and helpful. Um, it's, it's cool. I think it's just astounding to me that it's a voluntary system. Our building codes are too. That's something I'd like to start getting involved in in the future. I just haven't haven't really made the commitment. I stopped doing ASHRAE. I needed to take a little break after a while, but I think I'd like to start getting involved again on the code side. Cause that like, they're open hearings. Like you can just go. And I mean, there's a, there's an investment that you have to make to our industry to do that. But, um, people make it like, I, I, I think it's, it's so great to, to do that and be part of that and, um, influence the, like actually contribute to, um, why thing our standards, why things are the way that they are. Um, there's a lot of ways to contribute. This is one way too, like participating in stuff like this. I think, I think also in terms of green building, the passive house community has punched way above their weight in terms of influencing our industry. Like you end up when you, when you sit on these things, you end up having an outsized influence in your profession. And if you're doing good work, that's a good thing. If you're not doing good work, don't show up, <laughs> but you know, um, anyway, I met the best people at ASHRAE, including Lou Harriman. It's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, Allison Bales could chime in on, on this, but I, I know that there's a uh, work underway to, to dovetail off of that passive house comment of actually getting a lot of the passive house, uh, methodology is being reviewed by ASHRAE right now so that we can move towards its adoption in future code cycles. And I don't know how much of it will end up being adopted, but just to see that it's gone from this very, you know, kind of fringe building thing, you know, a decade and a half ago to now being adopted by ASHRAE for its serious, you know, technical review is pretty incredible. Yeah. Yeah. It's cool. It's cool stuff. I have a, um, I, ventilation was a real, a part of the other reason I got involved in ASHRAE is because I didn't really understand ventilation <laughs> at all. Um, so I was like, well, I guess I have this weakness or this blind spot in my, in my professional knowledge. I guess if I just keep showing up, maybe I'll learn some things. And I did. Um, I actually just filmed. It's funny to, I've been thinking about Lou Harriman in particular recently because I just um, filmed this weekend, a new class um, to, uh, to a company building science for architects on ventilation. So just the fundamentals of ventilation. Um, Cause I figured a lot of us aren't, we're not mechanical systems designers, but we need to know enough to ask for the right things. So that's the, it's coming soon. Shameless plug. I, no, that's a great plug. And I hope that it talks about too, because this, this just keeps coming up for us is coordination of mechanical systems. Like I don't necessarily need to know 
the ins and outs of the mechanical system. Like I am not a mechanical engineer. I've realized that I know what I need to ask for. And then what I need to know is what I need to plan for. And that's from the design perspective, really important because the figure it out in the field is usually when you end up with things in weird places. Um, or, you know, that we get architects have for years gotten a bad rap that we don't leave enough room for mechanical systems or plan for mechanical systems. And so, um, and I think you, you definitely weren't the only one who didn't know what the V in HVAC was really for. Cause I mean, we've talked to Allison about that. We've talked, you know, we've talked to lots of people about <laughs> ventilation is like this mystery. <laughs> okay. Okay. So you know what else I'm going to just share like the depth of my ignorance here. So I didn't get like, I didn't for like a really long time. I didn't understand what ERVs and HRVs were. And you know why is because of the name energy recovery and ventilator to me made it seem like the goal of using the ERV or the HRV, like it was because of energy. And I didn't get that. Uh, well, yeah, like it, it accomplishes this thing. Um, more efficiently than another way that we could maybe do it. But the purpose of including it is for ventilation. Like it's a way of providing balanced ventilation. So sort of like um, um, my, I was talking to my husband about this because I was confessing my ignorance and he was, uh, I was like, well, what's an example of this? And we were thinking about how, you know, how in um, like a hybrid car, how when you hit the brakes, you um, hitting the brakes helps recharge the battery. So that's awesome. That's really cool. But the purpose of hitting the brakes isn't to recharge the battery. It's to make the car stop. And that's like an ERV or an HRV. Like the purpose isn't the energy part. The ventilator part of, of the of the acronym is the is the critical one. Um, anyway, so. So you want us to start just, saying HRV and ERV v. instead of <laughs> ERV and HRV. It's the emphasis. ERV. <laughs> go along with that is is the E according to, I think a lot of mechanical people is enthalpy, not energy, but so many people don't know what enthalpy is. is you oh, just I didn't them. even know that. I look at me in my ignorance, teaching a whole class on this. And I didn't even know. I, well, yeah, and so that's okay because not. enthalpy is like this mystery word to know. So there's like, well, what, you know, I will, we'll, we'll no, use you know what enthalpy word. means? Enthalpy means I'm smart and I'm smarter than you. <laughs> Excuse to get out the psychrometric chart and make sentence? everyone else feel okay. stupid. And, and it still doesn't matter because the important part was still the ventilation part at the end of that. <laughs> no matter what the E stood for. That's really funny. Well, thanks. Look at this. This is like uh, now, now I can put this in a little note in my class. I've already filmed it. So, but I can put the little the little asterisks or something and be like, it actually stands for enthalpy, but people just say energy. And I knew that all along, I'm just using terms that are more familiar to you. I can, I can. Christine, I see that you do the same thing I do, which is you create the illusion that you don't know something to lure people in so that you share the knowledge no, in a way I that really doesn't make them feel ignorant. Know. <laughs> no, truly. I did not know. I like, I didn't, I didn't understand what an ear, it was um, in, in all seriousness, the, the way I thought of mechanical systems was magic box. It was, we, we buy this magic box and it does stuff. Like I didn't, I didn't even understand for a long time um, that, and I think, I think this is where a lot of people go wrong. They go wrong all the way at the beginning and they go wrong at, um, they feel air coming into when they're, when their heater or their air they're you know, they're, when their furnace is on or when their air conditioner is on, they feel air coming in through the registers and they sort of assume that the ventilation component is taken care of somehow by that magic box in the attic or in the basement. Like they don't, they don't know. And I thought that as a professional for a long time, I just assumed that that was how it worked somehow. Like somebody else worries about that. I don't, I don't, I don't know about that. Well, if your ducts are leaky enough and your house is leaky enough, it does. Well, and, but I, I didn't like, I really didn't know. And I, th I think a lot of people don't know that essentially exhaust, like the ventilation that they're getting in their houses is from their bathroom fan or their kitchen, right? The, the, the concept of exhaust only they ventilation, use they don't know what that is. They just assume that there must be some provision to the extent that they've, that they've thought about it at all, that there must be some provision for, for fresh air some, somewhere. Um, 
So anyway, so I, and I am not different than that. I assumed the same thing. Also like this stuff gets really hard. So I think probably a lot of people are like me, they compartmentalize. So they're like, so I did think of it as like magic box kind of conceptually, but also like in my own, like, we're going to put that aside. Here's that, this area of study stuff that I don't get right now. I'm not going to deal with that. I'm going to deal with this. I'm going to deal with the enclosure. I understand the enclosure or I'm starting to understand the enclosure. So I'm going to deal with that stuff. And then I'll, you know, whatever the mechanical stuff, someone else can do. And then you realize that there's no uh, wizard behind the curtain and you have to do it yourself. <laughs> well said. I want to ask you about vapor. I've been dealing with vapor a lot lately and not in a real way, but in a theoretical way, which is okay. the worst way, uh, <laughs> in my opinion, because if you see it in an actual place, then you can just manage it and it's done. But it's so rare to actually deal with vapor in the real world. It's almost all theoretical. So I imagine you might also be frustrated with vapor and perhaps tired of dealing with the boogeyman of vapor. Uh, and I wonder if you'd talk about that. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, I get frustrated with it because it's so complicated and it's also usually not what's causing people problems. So like, I'm trying to think in my forensic practice of how often poor, like water vapor management has caused a problem and it's definitely happened, but like really 99 times out of a hundred, the problem is like in forensics, even in complicated forensics is flashing. Um, so somebody asked me, somebody asked, one of the cool things about our profession is that it isn't that big. So it's like you get really interesting jobs sometimes. So somebody asked in the chat earlier, like what the, what the airplanes were. Um, those are, this is a photo taken by uh, an architectural photographer, actually, who just really likes airplanes. So photographing airplanes is his hobby. And this is, he took this photo from a helicopter. It's LAX. And I, I loved, I, I like his work otherwise. And so I got this photograph, but I also worked at LAX. I worked, they had a, at their air traffic control tower had, um, had a problem that they couldn't figure out. Um, for a long, long time. And it just seemed really complicated. And so I got hired to figure out well, what's going on. They were getting water that was sort of unpredictable. And the problem seemed to have started after they put on a new roof. So they thought that the roof was leaking, but that didn't really make sense because the roof looked fine. They just couldn't tell what was going on. Anyway, I went out to investigate and it was like a super complicated investigation because it's at an airport. And the the stuff I had to look up, it was, this is an air traffic control tower. So they have to use it and it was up high and I had to get a lift. And anyway, it was a, it was a crazy job. I also incidentally took a friend. These are published. I can't believe I'm telling this story. Whatever I started, we got to keep going. Um, I took <laughs> a friend of mine from, I was working for building science corporation and the, um, the graphic designer at BSC was a classmate of mine. She did it part-time and she was a classmate of mine from architecture school. Um, so she, she's a registered architect and was at the time, but did not like had no forensic experience at all, but we were really, BSC was really busy and I needed somebody else. Like you can't do an airport water leakage investigation with one person. You just, you can't do that. Um, she was the only one who was available. So I was like, okay, let's, I'll take Ashley up. Um, so she had no experience doing it. Um, but is smart and wonderful. But, um, anyway, so we went up and we took a look at this, um, this is, I can't believe how sidetracked I'm getting from water vapor. But anyway, we got in the boom lift at the airport in LA and I, I got, I'm riding the boom lift and get to the top. And I kind of suspected, like I kind of, I knew where to look based on what they were saying the problem was. So the first place I decided to look and it was mirror images. So there was, there was a second condition, the same condition on the other side of the building. So I get up in the boom lift and it was a hole. Like it was just, and I could put my hand through it. It was just an opening. And it was, um, it was a hole in the wall. It was like right at a, at a corner and it was, a you know, glazing here and metal panels here. So it was a glazing contractor doing this work and a metal panel contractor doing this other work. And the, there was just, there was a hole. I put my hand inside. It was a hole. You could see it was a hole. You could, it was a hole. Not my job. Exactly. And the reason, and the building was built in like 1985 or something. 
And it hadn't leaked because it was under under the roof. But when they re-roofed, they had this sort of gutter thing going on in their roof. And it was now directing water exactly at the hole. So the roof was not leaking. The building was leaking. It was leaking since 1985, but not bad enough for anyone to notice. Um, anyway, um, I put my friend from architecture school who'd never been in the lift before um, to look at the other side just because it's cool. I mean, you're at LAX. You should be in a boom lift. Like if you can, that's cool. Oh, but I did go uh, through my through my mental, like my dad used to, he still says, he's like, if you want to get the dough, you got to do the show. And I'd been prepared to do like water leakage tests and all this stuff. But the other side of me was like, well, this is an airport. This is dangerous. Like, I don't want to do a water leakage test. This is dumb. Like the, I know the problem. It's a hole. Um, so we ended up just leaving. It was, I, I was on site maybe two hours and like an hour and 45 minutes was set up. And, and then we let, we went to the beach. We went to, we went to the beach. We were like, we were like okay, let's go. We were flying out that night. We went to the beach, but, um, the client also didn't want to, um, afterwards they, objected to the fee because it was a fixed fee job and the report was like five pages and I was really stretching it out to get to those five pages let me tell you um and they were like well we don't think this is this report is worth whatever like what the heck anyway it's like it was a hole but you have to anyway was it four different pages of different angle photographs of the hole and like one with your hand through it of the five pages three were photos yeah good job (laughs) double spaced you know extra large font no um 37 8 by 10 color glossy photos i know exactly (laughs) but um anyway and i mean we've i've sketched up how they should fix it whatever it was it was fine but all this to say is that the even though the building might be complicated or the investigation can be complicated like I really have to say that most of the time in my forensic practice, even if it's LAX, like the problem is, is um, this, not this it's flashing. It's, it's flashing problems. Now there are water vapor problems, but usually not Uh, on the flip side of that. So that was obviously a very simple one. What was the hardest one you've ever dealt with? Uh, Odor investigations. I find to be the hardest ones. Um, Those are, they're just, they're really hard. Um, incidentally, really helps be a woman on odor investigations because we actually have more receptors in our, in our nose. Um, so we can smell things faster. So anyway, that was, I've, I've done a few like with, with, um, usually with Coda, um, Coda Weno from BSC. He's, um, just unbelievably good at understanding pressure relationships in buildings. And, um, And he's, he's a great person for that kind of stuff, but that's very, you end up essentially, it's sort of similar to a leak investigation in that you have to replicate the smell, um, and, and try to sort of eliminate parts of the building. But with water, we test, you know, low to high and gravity is pretty intuitive for us, but with odor, like pressure is, is very difficult to control. And it's hard to have that sort of systematic elimination of elements in, um, in an odor investigation, um, like, ke- like chemical sensitivities or something like that. Yeah. Or it's not, I mean, the most interesting one I did with Coda and, um, do you guys know Bart Lamel? He's out in Colorado. Um, very cool dude as well. He calls himself a forensic carpenter, which I love. Um, he, um, he's like definitely a dude. Like that's his, he's from Colorado. He is athletic. He is laid back. He is, he is chilling out. Um, and so we did this investigation. Then of, of course, Coda is many of, you know, Coda, I know he presents at, at has he been a guest on BS and beer? Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Um, so Coda is like just brilliant and buttoned up and you know it from the second you like from the second you meet him um and bart is also brilliant um but like he's just very laid back anyway so i was on this investigation with the two of them at the aspen opera house and it would occasionally um smell like sewage in the opera house and it was getting so bad that performers were refusing to perform which 
people in Aspen apparently don't like being told no by celebrities who get invited to come. So um, anyway, this problem went on for a long time and nobody could figure this out. And I was really just assisting on this one. Um, I felt like I could really contribute <laughs> by my keen sense of smell to this team. But um, <laughs> like Coda was really leading the charge on this one. But we were, you know, we were isolating these environment, like trying to figure out these pressure relationships, pressurizing one area, depressurizing another. And we worked um, our, the full first day and we, we were just no closer to solving anything. Second day, we eliminated a whole bunch of stuff, but still we had not been able to replicate the leak all through lunch. And I mean, we were really, I was, I think at lunch or maybe the dinner the night before I was asking these two, these two men who I really liked who are more experienced in the industry, like, what have you done? Have you ever had a case that you couldn't solve? And like, what did you do? We told, we told some cool stories about that, but anyway, we, I really thought we weren't going to solve this one. I think we all did. And then at the very end of this, like we just, we'd done like so much, like all the go-go gadget stuff you can think of we had done. And Bart Lamel, laid back California dude was like, let me try something. And um, we were up on the roof and the building engineer was like chain smoking menthols the whole time. And so Bart said, give me one of your, give me one of your menthols. And he lit the cigarette and he held the cigarette by the um, one of the, like the plumbing vent stack. And there was one air intake on this roof, but it was like, way the heck on the other side of the roof. And he was like, you know what, let's just see. And when the wind blew in from the mountains, like just the right way, and Bart had the menthol cigarette up by the plumbing vent stack, like 30 seconds later, I swear to you, you could smell cigarette smoke inside the control room of the theater, like, like that. Um, anyway, and the low tech solution to illustrate it to the client was a cigarette. Um, so, I mean, go figure you can do, and it's from knowing stuff about how buildings are built and, and being creative and weird, seeing weird connections. I, I would definitely not have figured that out myself. Um, what, what was the solution, Christine? <laughs> um, so I don't entirely remember it. I think it was essentially just relocating where the air intake was. Um, and better filtration. Um, but I'm not entirely sure. It was already, so somebody's saying taller smokes that it was already really pretty tall. Um, it's, I, I have a picture, Bart Lamel, who was holding a cigarette was, could, could barely reach it. Um, so it was really, this was not intuitive. You really would not have put the two of these things together. Um, Aspen moved the mountain, if I remember correctly. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Melvin, is that Jeff Melvin? Um, I hope so. Yeah, Jeff Melvin. Um, anyway, cool, cool. Uh, it, it was a, it was a kind of a weird project. Um, kind of like the Aspen one and that the solution seemed like deceptively simple. Um, but they didn't do it for a while, like a year. Like it was such a, it was so counterintuitive. I remember we were friends with the, um, we're buddies with the chief building official and who has since retired. And like a year later, he was like, no, I didn't do anything. They didn't like, I don't know. Sometimes clients are funny that way. They get all upset about something and then, and then they get the answer. And then they're like, yeah. They I find out how much it would cost to fix it. And then they're like, oh, you know, it's really not that bad. You know, it's, I know, you know sometimes, but this was not, ex this wasn't it. expensive, right? This was like so lame, but eh, whatever. And this is why Coda keeps a pack of menthols in his kit now. Uh, you know, you can see him rolled up in his sleeve on a lot of jobs. Why he took up smoking. Oh, yeah. It's hilarious because I, I make so much fun of Coda for this one because his his thing, it's like a um his tool thing, it's it's like a front his, his chest one, rig, yeah. And it looks like a like a maternity sympathy vest, like that a man would wear to like understand what like that's what it looks like uh, to me anyway. <laughs> it's not um, but anyway. I love doing. I think he looks like he's going into battle or something like that. I'll give him something a little more. Oh, I love there. doing. I, I love doing projects with Coda because he is like, clients just immediately trust him. Whereas you know how a lot of us when we go on job sites with clients, or you're always sort of, you're trying to establish credibility, trying to establish trust. 
Like you show up with Coda, like they're on, there's just something about him that is very reassuring to clients. Um, I wish I could package that and sell it or just package it and keep it for myself. <laughs> Apparently you have to show up with a guest, a vest full of the vest, gadgets. Yeah, the, the front. You gotta, like, you gotta have the gadgets. <laughs> or maybe get like a ghost Ghostbusters car and, and like just kind of use the whole Ghostbusters theme. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think we overstate the importance of the vest. I think it's the fact that every time you ask Koda a question, he not only knows the answer, but he knows the multiple references that would help him arrive at that answer. And he can cite the references and then explain the references that built the study that they are now referencing in the additional study. It's like all of that library compressed into Koda. Yeah. And it's like a 30 yeah, second like 20, yeah. from MIT. <laughs> I was gonna say it's like a 30 second pause too, where you see him computing like a like a <laughs> computer. It's like and then out comes like brilliant. Tabulating. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> He's amazing. Is so he we've, we've touched, we've touched on a little bit about you sharing knowledge and a little bit about you learning from Ashray. Uh, what are some other resources that you like to lean on to continue learning? You guys. Other than us. Yeah. Yeah. Other I mean, than obviously. Seriously. It's, I, I've like learning in community has just been amazing. I, I didn't like, there's a lot of real crappy stuff related to social media and it's really bad for a lot of us. I think it's not in a lot of ways. It's not good for, it's just not good for us as humans, like comparison and not feeling good about ourselves and um, sort of stoking envy and anger and resentment. But in the context of the kind of building community, the professional community, I have found it to be such a rich resource and probably one of the best of my, of, of my career um, is, yeah. A big part also is um, because buildings are, um, John Straub says this, or he, maybe he wasn't the first to say it, but that every building is essentially a prototype um, that we never build two quite the same way. They're all different. And what that means is that in our careers, we're kind of limited by the number of buildings that we, we can possibly work on, which is not that many in our careers. And so if you get to be friends with people and connect with people and have technical conversations, you get to hear stories and you establish sort of a more intelligent, I think, baseline for stuff. Like our conversation about windows and, and interior ceiling of windows, there were like a thousand things that we didn't actually state that would have been valuable for somebody listening in to, to see like, oh, okay, well, I always only sealed my windows. I didn't know that there were these other two methods. Um, and I didn't know how common they were. I didn't like, um, anyway, uh, I didn't know that Michael routinely tested his buildings. And I, like, you know, there's, when you, when you hear people just, just even casual conversations about technical things, you, you learn something, even if you don't even realize you're learning something has to, to compare. So anyway, that's been the, the biggest thing. Um, I also like, I feel like I get credit for this, but like posting stuff on Instagram, I basically crowdsourced my peer review <laughs> process. Like um, it's made me, it, it's, up to my game, technically speaking, but it's made me just a better teacher because I understand, like I read everybody's comments and questions for the most part. And I start to see like where people tend to get tripped up, what bothers them about something, what doesn't bother them about something, like where they're comfortable, where they're uncomfortable. And that adds up to knowing a great deal. When I st first started presenting, I remember one presentation I was taking over for somebody else and I was presenting on Windows and I was like, I felt so dumb teaching these people because I didn't know if I was insulting them or I was, so I was just showing what I did. And I was like, so yeah, that's it. You know, like I didn't, I didn't know what to tell them about. I didn't, I didn't know. I didn't know. Is this, is this normal in the industry? Is this just what I do? Like how different is what I do to what other people do? And um, anyway, so social media is a, a good resource. Um, other, other things I really learn a lot from. Uh, I guess like picking a handful of people that like me and are willing to share information with me and essentially forming a kind of informal collective, um, like professional collective. So even though I'm a sole practitioner, I think most sole practitioners, uh, well, actually are 
the other panelists, if I'm not mistaken, have all spent some time as sole practitioners, right? Yeah. So um, do you not essentially find that you have sort of a small group of people that you bounce, like if you're uncertain about something, there's, there's like a phone tree of people you call. And if they're not there, you're like, oh, you know. Um, anyway, that's, not, that's no different from me too. And I think when people only see the finished product, they sort of assume this level of polish um, to, to things that doesn't exist. Everything I post on Instagram, everything I teach on everything, um, or I mean, like almost everything, um, I run past this sort of small group of people to make sure I'm not out of line. So it, it only, I mean, I hope it looks like I know what I'm doing. I think it does. I think that's why I'm here, but, um, it's, 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 I'm not any different than any other professional. There's, I don't, and every professional I know has this group that they rely on. So, and actually speaking of full circle, Lou Harriman and Ashray, like Ashray is how I got some of those people on that list get involved in this stuff, show up. I think getting involved in that is a, exactly, that's how BS and beer started, right? Is so we had a local discussion group and, you know, Steve and Dan started it and people would get together and they would pitch ideas around and they realized everybody else had other ideas, but you form these local groups. And yeah. that's some of the wisdom that I try to impart to anybody who asks me is it's not necessarily about what, you know, it's about who, you know, to ask when you don't know something, right? right. Like, Who's your network to say like, you know, I'm, I'm not sure about this. Right. Cause if we all knew everything, that would be awesome. But <laughs> Colbert used to say that all the time is, you know, people give him the, the, the moniker that he's some great building science genius, but he admits to the fact that he just knows the right person to call on in the room to get the answer. Yeah. And that's really what a lot of this, this job or profession or industry is about. Right. Yeah. And people don't know with um like, there's so much information that's free on Google, like that you can just get online, but you have to sift through so much other stuff that I, I find even like, I don't ask Google first. I ask a colleague first and then I know, and then I sort of know where to look for more information. Uh, J Jimmy just asked, uh, for those cutting their teeth in building science, how do you recommend building rapport with clients and the rest of the team? We have Pancake. other <laughs> puppy. This is Katie. Oh. Katie is ghost face. She's an old lady. Oh. <laughs> <She's> impatient. <laughs> um, Building rapport, Michael, what was the second half of that question? Oh, how do you uh, yeah, how do you recommend building rapport with, with clients and the rest <laughs> of, of the team, you know, designers, builders, um, if, if, you're, if you're cutting your teeth in building science, I'm not, I'm not sure exactly where he's coming from, um, but, but I guess it's just, 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 just for anybody starting, starting in, in, in the industry, sort of how do, you, how, do you, how do you prove you know what you're talking about? Like, I mean, I, I, I can relate it to my own experience, you know, working under experienced carpenters and I was reading on the side and learning about air barriers and paper control and all that. And, and they're like, yeah, that's not how we do it. Like, how do you, how do you sort of transition into this, in, into better ways of building if, if you're not, if, if, if you're not a sole practitioner, if you're not the boss. With great difficulty. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, Go out on your own. <laughs> No, I mean, even then, I mean, our industry is collaborative and it's all about compromises and judgment calls. And, um, there isn't like, I don't, um, okay. So now pancake is jealous. <laughs> so we've got them both here. Um, so I don't know, I don't know how much, um, how much advice I can give to that, except to say that everybody struggles with it. And, um, yeah, it's, um, it's, it's tough. I think the one thing that probably helped me the most just personally is understanding that this is a long game. Um, and that, uh, I think I used to worry particularly when I'd be on job sites. Now I've, I spent a lot comparatively less time on job sites compared to a builder who's on job sites all the time. Um, I was on job sites a lot in my capacity as a consultant, but, um, you know, not as much as a builder. And I guess I used to think that without really thinking it through that people had to like, trust me or find me um, persuasive or my recommendations to be valuable. 
like right away. And that doesn't really happen. And I, I think that you get some freedom if you sort of let yourself off the hook for that and realize that maybe some people are going to trust you right away. Um, but most of the time, this is a, this is a long game and it's about establishing credibility. Like jobs are long, your involvement in a project, even if you're just a consultant, like, like my role is, is just consulting. Um, your role is ongoing in that project. So if somebody doesn't take, you don't have to like win approach every conversation. Like, like it's a battle that needs to be won. Um, do your job the best way you know how, and well, let the, let the chips fall. Um, that's, that's just personally been harder for me, but it, it, I think if you approach stuff that way, it fits more with that approach accommodates different personalities and different styles. Not everybody has the same personality and like, not everybody's as comfortable sort of socially having these conversations and being persuasive or they, and they worry that they have to like develop this whole other skill set to do their job well. And I don't think that's really true. I think you can have a lot of different personality types um, that like, you don't have to change your personality to be, <laughs> to be good at building science. Um, so anyway, I hope that is at least a little bit helpful. Um, but you know, you, you, do the best you can and compromise. You have to compromise. You're going to have to. You're you going to get overruled a lot. You posted something a while ago that I, I continually reference to people is that, you know, a lot of people look at people with uh, a broad understanding of building science and think that they're, you know, like naturally gifted in some way. Yeah. And yeah. in reality, what it truly is, it's just that we've, we, we've stumbled over that curb already and we've learned to pick our feet right. up. It's just, we've, we've been there and we've been able to think through the questions. It's not that we have some god-given ability to ascertain how a building is going to perform it's just that we've we've screwed it up already or we've watched yeah, somebody else yeah. screw it up and we've remembered it yeah well, and guess- people feel judged a lot in this like so it's hard sometimes to ex- like to share to you know share this information in a way that isn't received as criticism um and sometimes you have to pull rank and say no this is wrong i'm not going to do it this way period um but those are that's not, I don't know, maybe when I was younger, I thought things were just more dramatic. And I thought that that would happen a lot more in my career. And it hasn't, I mean, it's happened before, but like really rarely. Well, I think too, it goes back to when you finally meet the one person who you have the aha moment where it clicks too, right? It's like everybody learns differently, right? Or so it might take the third or fourth person that you've heard it from for you to connect the analogy to like, maybe you've stumbled over the block. Maybe you've made the mistake, or maybe you've just finally met that one person who explains it to you in a way that makes sense to you. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. And it's sort of funny in this industry, like a lot of us are, we're playing both roles. We're both givers of information and receivers of information. And I, I think that kind of helps people, um, become better at interacting is when you, when you, the more time you spend on both sides of this. (laughs) Um, but yeah, I mean, like you want to get better at teaching stuff, start teaching it start talking about it. Um, I always, I always say that you don't know if you actually know something until you have to teach someone else how to do it. And then you find out if you actually know, (laughs) Yep. but that gets, I mean, that's one of the reasons, um, excuse me. I taught, I started teaching my classes is that I noticed that my architecture school classmates who didn't have very much field experience were really struggling with like, they, they would know something's right. Um, or, or they'd know something was wrong and they'd ask a question about it of their project manager or the contractor or whatever, and get an, un, like a very unsatisfying answer. Like either they'd get no response, they'd get a dodge, or they'd get a response that they just really were like, mm, that doesn't make any logical sense. But then they had to stop. Like they knew it was wrong, but they didn't know enough to take it to the next level and say, ah, but <laughs> what about, you know, they didn't like, they, it's very frustrating. I, we've all had this experience where, you know, you're right, but you can't prove your rights or you don't know how you're right or, or why you're right, but you know, you're right. Um, or, you know, that what someone's telling you isn't complete it, it, and anyway. And, um, 
that's why I, I like the more of a foundation you have in building science, the, um, the less that happens in an uncomfortable way. And the more you're able to um, be like, okay, um, I can put this in context. And I understand that this is inconsistent with first principles in three ways or, you know, or in one really important way. And you can, you're better able, you have this framework where you're better able to articulate it, even if it's just for yourself, even if you do for whatever reason, you, you know, you don't want to pick a fight with your boss or something, or you don't want to have this discussion in front of your client. Um, <clears throat> but you can at least articulate it for yourselves. But the, um, I think the, I think the biggest thing is the better, you know, building science, the more, um, flexible and accommodating you can be, the less, you know, the science, the more conservative you ha you have to be. So when you get a request to change something, like you don't know enough really to say yes. Like, so one of the, my favorite things about building science is the better I know it, the more I can say yes to people, the more I can accommodate their suggestions, their preferences, their products, recommendations, their, like, the more I can say yes to people, um, the better I know the science, the more comfortable I am. When somebody asks me to do something that I've never done before, never seen before, like I have to say no. So that's sort of the gift of experience and building science in our industry is that we get to we get to be more creative, not less creative. And I think it's sort of funny when people approach this stuff at the beginning, they, they're scared of it. It's like, oh, this sciencey stuff, I don't know about this. This is like, they're, it's natural to be afraid of it, but it's, I guess, counterintuitively, it lets you do way, it's not a hindrance to creativity, it's an aid to creativity. Like, you know where your boundaries are um, a lot, a lot better. Um, sort of like if you have like, I remember being in my twenties and understanding kind of like getting, understanding budgeting for the first time ever, where if I wasn't really paying attention to my expenses, it felt so overwhelming. But if I kind of, if I knew, even if I wasn't making a whole lot of money, which was the case, um, like having a budget and knowing where I stood meant I can go enjoy going out to dinner or a movie or having drinks at the bar or whatever. Cause I knew that I had allocated a certain amount of money for this and I can, I have freedom within this constraint, you know, um, building science gives you that framework. So you have freedom within the constraint. Like, you know, where the boundary is, you don't accidentally, um, run up with a bunch of credit card debt. Mastery of the theoretical gives you freedom in the practical. It's a really nice. Exactly. Ooh, I like that summary. Yeah, I think that's extremely gratifying. And I think you do that really, really well because you don't have to say no a lot because you can operate within this system or this system and you can apply this principle to that product and make it work in that climate because you understand what you're actually up against. Right. You were the first person I ever heard talk about uh, the frequency of rainfall in the different places that you were like managing your design for a, a window yeah. assembly or whatever. And you're like, yes, that's fine, but not in the Pacific Northwest. Right. It's fine because you're in Austin. So yeah. enjoy. And I was like, ah, that makes perfect sense because as a builder, I'm mostly managing risk. I'm looking at things and going, mm, yeah, I would like that to be better. And the way that we could make that better is X, Y, and Z, which would all cost six factors of X right now. What's right. our real risk though? Like if exactly. we just do this one and I think you really help with that. And I really appreciate that about you. And you're very, very specific like you're not overly broad, but you're, you're definitely always referencing the theory and that makes it work. So I, yeah, I, I want people to know, that. like, I want people to know what my logic is so that they can, so that they can disagree if it doesn't apply to them. Like, and I, I think it's actually one of, I, this is something frustrating. I find this very frustrating as a teacher, um, is I'll see other people teach this. Now I'm going to share my anxieties about life. Um, I'll sometimes hear other people teach in our industry and some of their approach to it is, um, it's, I'm gonna prove to you that I'm really smart and I'm gonna convince you that this topic is really complicated and therefore you should hire me to solve this problem for you. It's really beyond you, but I'm smart and I've got it figured out. So that's why you should hire me as a consultant. And I think a lot of that is because a lot of the teaching is done by people who are not, um, like they don't make their money from teaching. They make their money from being consultants. So they're, that's, that's, they're not getting paid to teach. So they're using it as marketing and that's 
that's how they've thought that marketing is good. Let's make this thing seem intimidating and hard to understand. And then you, you hire me. Um, and even though I'm also a consultant, I just don't, I, for, I don't like that. And, um, I also think it's a little bit silly, like that in any one instance, like I'm going to, that I'm talking to, that everybody I'm talking to is a potential client. I just find that laughable. Um, and I just never get real clients that way anyway. So I just think it's dumb. So maybe that's part of it, but that just really annoys me. That approach really annoys me. I like to, when I'm learning something, I like to hear, I don't want to just hear the conclusion. I want to hear the, the logic, like, here's what, here's how I arrived at that because there's always exceptions and qualifiers. And what if those things don't apply to me? Or what if I'm working on a different building type? Or what if I have different priorities? Like, I'm not going to approach it the same way if I'm doing a museum or if it's a warehouse or what if I'm on a really limited budget? Um, like, you know, what am I, what do I do? And um, anyway, so I always like to give, but it, but it's frustrating because the person who does that gets criticized more because you're arming your audience with the tools to criticize your conclusion. Um, and I think that's ultimately better for everybody. And I'm not that upset that this is what I do, but it means that um, it, people who do that, including me, but people who teach in that way get, are the subject of a lot more criticism than people who I think um, often don't understand their subject matter as well, or maybe they do, but they just, they don't invite that same kind of participation. I think it's, honestly, I think it's how much they respect their audience or not. Um, anyway. Right. Oh, maybe I that's agree. I think everybody you teach should hopefully be a future colleague that raises the bar in the industry. Right. Right. Yeah. That, I hope everybody that I teach something to is eventually somebody who's another colleague who's going to teach me something in the future that I'm going to learn, you know, like, yeah, we're, we're here. I, like, I don't want to sell something to you. I want to learn something from you. Like when we're like, we're not, it's, I'm not a kindergarten teacher. Like I'm an adult who's teaching other adults who are typically practicing professionals. Now, some of them are just out of school. And I will admit that somebody just out of school probably has only a limited number of things that they can teach me about. Um, but most of the people that I'm teaching, I can learn not just a little bit from, but a lot from, and you like, you don't know who you're talking to sometimes you know, you're teaching. And, um, uh, anyway, I did a, I, I was talking to somebody once about, um, somebody was asking me a question about, um, about building science. And I answered, this was via email. And, um, sometime later I was doing some research on a different topic on related to architectural acoustics. And I pulled out my textbook on architectural acoustics and was, was looking for this. And I, it occurred to me as I'm, as I'm reading this, I'm like that name, I know that name. So I searched in my, in my email inbox, the name, and sure enough, it was like this acoustic specialist who's like written the book on acoustics, uh, had a building science question about roofing that I answered nicely. I don't answer everybody's questions. So I'm sorry, uh, but I do when I can. And, um, and he's this like amazingly respected practitioner in the field of acoustics. But I, th I think if you approach this stuff, like, like anybody who gets asked a question gets to be like, you know, king or queen of the subject matter for that 10 minutes that they're answering the question. I think you end up really missing out on, on um, relationships that could end up being pretty valuable and information that can be pretty cool. It's, I mean, it's better if it's a two-way street for everybody. Anyway, so I've learned a lot about acoustics from this guy because <laughs> now I know him. I'm like, oh, you ask me a question, I can ask you questions. <laughs> <laughs> a quid pro quo, sure. Oh, I've got Suzanne says she learned about my Instagram page from a fourth year architecture student. That's awesome. There's a guy from my church too, who um, we met. He's a, he's a young, I'm not sure if he's licensed yet. He's, I think he just took his last um, ARE. So fingers, fingers crossed for him. Um, but um, we, I, we, we met socially just at, at church. And I was like, yeah, you're, I've got this Instagram page. Check it out if you're interested. And then like a week later, the next Sunday, he was like, oh my gosh, all of my friends know you. <laughs> um, but anyway, he didn't know. It's sort of funny how this stuff like viral stuff is. And he's just a guy who goes to church in Dallas. Who's, who's 
who's a hopefully a new architect. Um, but the legend a, grows. You're a juggernaut. That's right. That's right. <laughs> My husband always finds this funny though, when we're in some sort of social setting and somebody like knows me <laughs> from Instagram. It doesn't happen very often, but when it does happen, I feel like a real celebrity. <laughs> My wife torments me ruthlessly because we've had a couple of those experiences. Isn't it hilarious? Oh God, it's so awkward. You're the Ben Bogey? Hey! <laughs> hey, aren't you Ben Bogey from Instagram? My wife will just like say that as I'm like walking down the sidewalk. I'm like, I hate you. I totally hate you. <laughs> I like to say that being famous in building science is like getting the lead in the high school musical. Like your mom probably cares and maybe yeah, like yeah. 20 other people. And then everyone else is like, you know, yeah. you, you do what? You do what? <laughs> Nerd. Until yeah. we take it to IBS and then you can no longer pretend. I don't, I don't know, Travis, you posted something on Instagram and it blew something up for someone. And you know, you, you're pretending you're like this little humble Midwest builder who doesn't know anybody, but people know who you are. <laughs> the I got a supporting role in the musical. In. <laughs> you got a supporting role in the musical. <laughs> yeah. I was, I was Caiaphas in Jesus Christ superstar. I'm no joke. Ask my mom. She'll tell you. <laughs> Uh, oh man we okay, can't finish we on like that do something else please left there's like a whole host of questions we never got to the chat box was box was blown up if you need some content for the next like year christine we've got like, a whole <laughs> bunch of questions oh my gosh i've been having such a hard time i've been so busy with these new courses i haven't i've been completely neglecting my instagram stuff so i'll have to get back to that <laughs> But so what's your final takeaway? What's your final leaving point for people who, who joined us tonight? Like, what do they need uh, to know? I mean, have fun doing it. Make it community, learn through community, have fun. It's way easier to learn when you're, when you're doing it in community and when you're having fun. Um, I think everybody kind of already knows that because they're hanging out on a Thursday night on a um, Thursday night <laughs> drinking beer or wine or cocktail or water. Or yeah. fun. I mean, it's really fun. It's, it's really fun. I hope we do this. I, I really doing this in person is, um, is even more fun, but, um, yeah, I think I didn't really realize until maybe the pandemic stuff really made it more obvious anyway, the, how much, how much in our industry we get out of community, like professional community. I think is really, um, it's really beneficial. It's, it's cool. It's, uh, it's neat stuff. I, it's also humbling, like in, in all the right ways, like you pick up the phone and you talk to somebody about a problem that maybe you thought you didn't fully understand. And then you talk to someone else and you're like, wow, I really didn't understand that. <laughs> like, um, you know, I need to, I need to maybe hold back a little bit till I, till I learn more, but no community is so great for exactly that reason. It's, um, and it's not just a benefit. It's not just a professional benefit in terms of actual skills. It's, um, it's a real encouragement. Um, and I think sometimes we confuse those two things sometimes. Um, so people sometimes ask me for advice and I think actually like 90% of what passes for advice isn't really actually advice. It's just encouragement that people, what people really need is encouragement. Everybody's different. So like the advice stuff, what works for you might not work for me. Um, but I think what we really need and what we can get out of community is encouragement. Awesome. Those are really good parting thoughts. It's really Great good. Job. Be an encourager. <laughs> Great Joe. If you're not following her already, uh, building science fight club.com and on Instagram, um, take the course. Sign up for ventilation because the last yeah. year so it and a half come out in December. Years. <laughs> it should um it should come out in December in time for people's CEUs. But I hope it's and it's uh it's about two hours. Um and it's not about sizing equipment or like the equipment itself. It's about what do we want the interior conditions to be like and why? Like what are our constraints related to what our interior conditions should be like from a comfort perspective, from a durability perspective, including risk, um, and from a health perspective. And then um, what are we currently doing uh, and problems with our current approach? And then the third part is what we might do instead. So um, I, hope, I hope people really like it. I basically did it for myself. So it's essentially like the... Um, I'm taking you through how I learned about ventilation and it represents 
pretty much everything I know. <laughs> if it's not in there, I don't know it. <laughs> Christine's comprehensive guide to ventilation for architects, but also for building science enthusiasts and exceedingly handsome builders from the Midwest. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, that's really who I did it for. <laughs> exactly. Thanks, Christine. <laughs> Thank you, Christine. Thanks so you just gotta much, work man. on your nails, so Travis. Fun. I can't wait to see you in February. I, maybe I will set up a booth. Someone's got to have a little manicure station there for the. <laughs> Ask Christine. Need the massage chair. How you get a manicure? Nobody's thought of this, right? For IBS, like this should be a thing. Like it should be sponsored by a nail polish manufacturer or something. <laughs> There's our five figure idea. Then Bogey, get on that. Yeah. Revlon, L'Oreal, who makes exactly. nail polish? <laughs> beard grooming, yeah. Oh, I got a great beard oil for you. <laughs> I'm going to get a beard to wear to IBS. I'm just saying. <laughs> just saying. I mean, I'm going to hold you to it. Got to fit in, Emily. I'm going to go get out. I'm going to get an epic beard and a great shirt. I think that's only fair. Ben and I get our nails done. Emily gets a beard. It's only okay, fair. Okay, it's Perfect. cool. Perfect. Done. I but are you wearing vacation. it naturally or? Can't wish I could. Not gonna happen. <laughs> There's, it's just gonna break the loss. Of course you can. <laughs> I mean, it would take a lot of really interesting drugs to make that happen. I just don't <laughs> think it's gonna happen. But I totally rock the fake beard. I mean, we've got time though, Emily. We've got time. I do. I do. If I start now, I didn't know that um, Benjamin Opdyke was like into the mustache thing that's like part of their marketing yeah yeah it's like it's like yeah. a thing so you could be maybe sponsored <laughs> just say oh. hey all right i could totally rock the mustache what if i can't grow a beard i can if only grow a mustache a full beard mustache no i have to have an epic beard everybody else has a beard but me inbox is blowing up with obdike reps at the moment <laughs> you're what <laughs> Said Emily's inbox is blowing up with Obdike reps at the moment. <laughs> They're offering her all the drugs. Somebody get me an epic beard. <laughs> all the mustaches. <laughs> all the mustaches. Oh no, this is a oh. terrible way to end it. We oh. were at such a high <laughs> with Christine's <laughs> comments, and now we're talking about mustaches. I Attention thought I volunteered. Right now. I thought I volunteered for the accident part of family vacation, not the story part. Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> It's always a pleasure to see you, Christine. I, I want out of here. This is just sure. <laughs> getting far too, too weird, far we too gotta, quickly. We got to stop the recording, I think, for everybody's yeah. benefit. <laughs> Note to Jeff, legal, what was the show? To, yeah. <laughs> Cut it at 632 <laughs> Central, please. All right. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Christine. Thanks, guys. Have a good night. Have a good night. Thanks Bye. again. Bye. <laughs>